आई वी एम वेलकम टू ऑल थिंग्स पॉलिसी अ डेली पॉडकास्ट बाय द तक्षशिला इंस्टीट्यूशन we are a bunch of policy nerds based in bengaluru and we like bringing fresh perspectives to indian affairs and indian perspectives to global affairs so grab a cup of coffee sit back and join us for today's chat hi and welcome to all things policy my name is shambhavi and i work on life science policies here at takshashila it has been a while since i have sat down with the oldest soul at takshashila to have a heart to heart about some of the geekiest topics under the sun so here i am with my dear friend anirudh kani sethi what's up doc and we are going to be talking about the most controversial thing ever eugenics hmm so the reason why we started talking about eugenics is because uh, last week uh, an advisor at downing street andrew sabisky had to resign uh, post some of his uh, slightly contentious comments that were made public uh, this guy has been alleged to say Uh, about how um, women olympics are more similar to paralympics uh, than to men's olympics hmm. uh, that african americans uh, have lower intelligence than uh, white americans oh, it is getting better and better every second yeah he's he's a very interesting uh, guy he's quite open about it um, he had this uh, he was um, promoting this uh, drug that is supposed to increase intelligence hmm. uh, but has been shown to also be fatal when given to children and he said that the benefits of uh, increased intelligence are probably worth uh, the dead kid every year wow and right. this this is of course what led f- to a famous british geneticist getting involved in the whole conversation right yes uh, so richard dawkins came in um, and he tweeted that you can abhor uh, eugenics for ideological or philosophical reasons um, but it works in cats and dogs so it works hmm as everyone knows humans and cats and dogs are exactly the same yeah we have similar fertility rates and uh, the same uh, lifetimes hmm so all of that adds up indeed we do yes that that all makes sense hmm. so why exactly are we here doc oh we are trying to figure out uh, what kind of eugenics do we want hmm. since that's the way we are going yes since that's the way that the world is going Let's figure out what kind of eugenic policy we want. Yeah, this is the correct time, I think, politically in our country as well to have this discussion. Oh, absolutely! I mean, uh, I think it was just a year or two ago that a certain cultural organization uh, affiliated to a certain political party was talking about uh, sending out advisories to people about how to have tall boys with fair skin and blue eyes uh, through the consumption of certain dietary products. So um, yes, it is. Oh, just so the right it will be intercaste marriages. I was like, "Ha! Huh, <laughs> if you want to have tall boys with blue eyes, you should marry a foreigner." <laughs> Anyways, but no, uh, let's get back to this seriously because yeah. the reason why there's a lot of concern about eugenics coming up right now is because we have also enhanced the the techniques and the science behind doing gene editing, so we have a better understanding of how our genes function, hmm. uh, and we have a slightly better grasp of how we can manipulate the genes. Uh, to our own likings, right? The the low hanging fruit here is obviously disease remediation. Uh, so there are certain diseases that are caused by a single mutation or a single change in a gene, and we are quickly trying to make those tools that can help rectify that single change back to what is considered normal in a diverse human population. Which, if you think about it, sounds really good. So if you have thalassemia, for example, which uh, is a monogenic disease, you could change that, and then the child who suffers from thalassemia is no longer has to have the transfusion, doesn't have to have all of the symptoms, and fatigue which is associated with it. And you can continue to marry within your caste. Yes, you can. <laughs> There's another thing that we need to actually discuss about gene editing being used being used as insurance and the moral hazards that are that may be associated with it. Hmm. But coming back to eugenics, science has come a long way. since the world eugenics was tarnished by the experience of a lot of countries in the early 20th century uh, and as people might want to believe that germany was the architect of this it really was it mm. this primarily started in the uk and the us oh our colonial overlords who who thought that they had uh, the burden of civilizing the rest of the world came up with a genetic theory to justify all this what a surprise yeah, but the you know the length of your nose Uh, Indeed, the length of your nose, the straightness of it, uh, the circumference of your head uh, had a lot to do with how intelligent and capable and competent you are. Absolutely. But yeah, so this started. So the theories of genetic superiority started with the UK and in the US. The US all actually had institutionalized programs uh, to take women, to sterilize women, and uh, make sure that at least people of certain classes did not procreate. Jesus. 
Yeah. Uh, this is something that Sabisky also has actually said that uh, people should be considering permanent contraception at puberty to prevent the uh, start of an underclass. Sounds similar to what a certain Indian politician was doing in the 70s, I think. Right? Yes. I wasn't born then. Huh. You know, you were already still in the yes, office. Yes, but yes. I mean, it, it was, I, I, these kids just keep, coming, keep coming and going with their newfangled ideas. Of course. But um, it, it's it's quite interesting how it's always some rich tosh from the upper classes who decides that the lower classes have no right to procreate. Um, so it is impossible to not see that angle in, in, the, in the condescension of, of people like this. Yeah. It, and it is quite pervasive. I think people are doing it without even understanding uh, the problems we face. So, for example, I was reading this book DNA by James Watson uh, recently. James Watson is obviously one of the team members who founded the structure of the DNA hmm. um, on the basis of which we could have this entire field of molecular biology and genetics and can now manipulate DNA, right? And he talks about, uh, he has been widely criticized to be a racist. Uh, he has been widely criticized for his views on Africans, hmm. saying repeatedly that they have lower intelligence than Americans and not taking into account the fact that they have had less opportunity to educate and uh, get exposure as much as the Americans have, right? So he has been widely criticized for that. And in the book, he tries to make up for it by saying that, oh, but look, if you look at the IQ test and then Africans and African-Americans are doing poorer than the Americans are, and the argument that you know, the IQ tests were based on a certain kind of output, the IQ tests are best because they're based for Americans who have had a certain kind of opportunity, hmm. has something that has escaped his mind. Hmm. And he, he has taken into account that he has been criticized, but he still does not understand what he has been criticized for. And I think that is a part of being of a privilege that, that we are really, really struggling with to accept and move on, right? Hmm. I was watching this Marathi movie yesterday uh, called Kari Biscuit. It has nothing to do with eugenics, but uh, this movie is about this uh, two kids, a brother and sister duo, born in poverty, uh, and the girl is blind, and their mother dies um, telling the, the son is older. So the mother dies telling the son that you have to make sure that she believes that the young girl, Khari, always believes that she has a life of luxury. She shouldn't know that we are in poverty, that we live on the roadside. And so this guy always takes her up on a railway platform where it's windy and tells her we are sitting in a plane. Uh, mm. Or he believes he tries to recreate a lot of things around her with, because she cannot see. And she's never had the experience of being on a plane, right? She doesn't know mm. what being on a plane is. So I watched the movie. It's a really lovely movie. And then I was reading some of the reviews of the movie. Uh, and people are like, ha, huh, how can anyone believe uh, being on a railway platform that they are in a plane? And I was like, that's because you have been on a plane. <sighs> you know that it is not the same because you have been on a plane. He has absolutely no clue. I think that is a kind of privilege that we are just so used to. We cannot believe a life outside of that. But sorry, that was a complete digression from the actual eugenics topic. But No, but I, I think that this idea that people live such different lives based on what their socioeconomic background can be is something that seems to have escaped a lot of these pro-eugenics people. And I think Dawkins himself is a great example of that. Um, you mentioned earlier, Doc, how this guy says that, okay, you know, eugenics works in cats and dogs. Why can it not work in human beings? I'm quite surprised to hear that Dawkins would say something like that because the guy literally, he's, he's one of the biggest names in, in genetics. Do we really understand stuff like intelligence, height, and so on and so forth well enough to say that, um, you know, breeding certain kinds of people together will lead to better quality of offspring? Uh, First question. Second of all, is as you pointed out, the fact that IQ tests tests of various things are based on a on a certain standard, which is based on a very particular social group. Um, IQ is just one example of that. But if you think about stuff like beauty, for example, right? Well, we had that case of the Olympics, right, with the testosterone levels in women. But yeah, so this is this is something that we've talked about between the two of us, and uh, it's it's based on very particular constructs of gender, which again might seem uh, absolutely logical and rational when somebody like Richard Dawkins says that but you have to interrogate the biases you have to interrogate the privilege and the fact that he's talking from a very very particular bubble and it's very important to think about the real social consequences that all this might have now we have been obviously very sarcastic and have been leaning into the dark humor quite a bit up to this point uh, but let's try to just directly address the problematic uh, views that that are being put out and that, that are increasingly being normalized by this kind of behavior. Um, first of all is the fact that um, what is desirable in a human being can vary widely depending on a particular cultural context. 
Second of all is the fact that these are shaped by dominant structures within a society. So I'm sure that a lot of you would have noticed that all of a sudden every movie poster has a dude bro with gelled up hair mm-hmm. and, and, a, and a man bun or, or a beard. Whereas if you had gone back to the 90s, all the Bali heroes that you'd have seen would have had absolute clean shaves and and probably like shoulder length yeah. hair and so on and so forth. So beauty standards change so radically across time. Now, of course, haircuts are something that don't necessarily j- depend on your genetics, but stuff like uh, how many abs are seen as desirable, uh, how high your cheekbones should be, all very drastically, all of which we don't fully understand how the genetics of all these things work. Um, so saying that this is the norm and that we should be kind of breeding ourselves towards it or even worse, that we should be using a gene editing technology to be pushing ourselves towards it can have absolutely devastating social effects. So it's not going to be an equal society. Not everybody in, even let's say hypothetically, we have a society where everybody has access to gene editing. Not everybody is going to be able to access technologies of the same quality. Yeah. Not everybody is going to have the same ideas as to what is desirable. Uh, and most importantly is a risk that um, certain very loudmouthed cultural groups can say that this is what we think is normal and because the rest of society is too disparate, too diffused, are not able to respond to that. And that, yeah. that means an entire generation of, of children who are traumatized by this. And I think that's a, a discussion that really needs to be had in India today because of particular regulations that are coming out. Right. So uh, we obviously are trying to explore gene editing in India uh, and we should because we have a pretty high disease burden that gene editing might be able to impact. But the question really boils down to who gets to decide what gene editing applications are allowed and what are not. And what is the basis of that of that decision? Right. So the current way that it is structured, uh, we have the review committee on genetic manipulation, uh, which through which all applications have to go through for uh, also for gene editing, also for gene modified, genetically modified organisms. Uh, and then for gene therapy products, specifically, there's another subcommittee, which is a layer before the ACGM uh, that was formed in December through guidelines that the DBT has, which is the Department of Biotechnology has put through. So we have two committees which are primarily made up of scientists. Hmm. who are deciding on these applications. Now, the point is that they probably are the best people in India to figure out whether something is scientifically correct enough to be made, whether it has scientific maturity, whether it doesn't have off-target effects, whether it is not going to impact the health of a person or things like that. But what kind of moral or philosophical responsibilities they have in understanding what applications should be um, either promoted or should be uh, disallowed is something that I do not understand. This is a broader conversation that we need to have. Hmm. And I'm kind of of the view that uh, if an application is going to impact society, we need to have accountable people to make that decision on whether it's allowed or not. Whether it is an elected official, who I, at this point of time, I don't think India's elected officials have, <laughs> have the expertise to be making these calls. But we need someone with a little bit more accountability than than just an RCGM has. There needs to be there needs to be transparency in how the decision is taken, and especially as you pointed out, if it has social consequences, then um, society needs to be consulted in in decisions that could potentially transform the fate of future generations. At a minimum, it has to be a diverse group. It cannot just be scientists and doctors. Exactly, and and there's also the fact that very often scientists in India might be coming from a particular sort of bubble. They might not necessarily think that these that the social consequences of these technologies are important, which is fine. And the scientists, that's not necessarily their job. But they need to be people who are trained and qualified to think about this, um, to be involved in the decision. And most importantly, these kind of decisions need to be matters of public record. These, these kind of decisions need to be accountable in some or the other way to civil society, to the public sphere. We need to understand how these reasons are being taken, who is taking them, for what reasons there have to be ways to roll it back. Right. And I think this is particularly important is India's uh, social context because we have got so many diverse groups, hmm. so many economically diverse groups, social diverse groups, religious differences. I think we need a lot more public education uh, going on about about this incoming of gene editing and what it can be actually used for, like you were saying. We really don't understand intelligence factors so much. And there's a broader uh, broader philosophical question here because the idea that we can have eugenics on dogs and cats, uh, the problem with that is that, A, they multiply much faster than we do. Mm. But also we are providing them with a confined environment and we get to choose the parameters of that environment. Mm. So if you look at the idea of breeding and evolution, you're basically adapting to the environment. 
uh, and it is easier to control something in a controlled environment than an environment such as ours. Till this point of time, through trial and error, nature was choosing the characteristics that were best suited for the environmental changes that nature had. Yeah. Now we are saying that no, no, we'll choose what we think is brilliant. It might not necessarily have anything to do with the environment. But let's see. So if we have a bunch of people saying that we want to live in the tropics, but we want to have fair skin, hmm. we might have see cancer, skin cancer cases going up, right? Because we're not the best suited for the environment in in that case. Hmm. But it is our delusion that white skin is preferable over dark skin, which is which is a social problem in our brains, hmm. uh, which needs to be fixed before we start making any calls on what kind of gene editing is and, and given that. humanity's wonderful record with solving social problems <laughs> I, I think that that should give us that should make us a lot more cautious about these kind of clarion calls it, it's very strange how societies respond to technology right on the, on the mm. one hand you will have absolute Luddites who say, no, we will ban it. It, it threatens traditions and it th- threatens livelihoods and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, you have uh, people like Mr. Sabisky who are essentially calling for it to be used um, to push a very particular narrow-minded vision of what society should look like. Um, what gave him the authority to decide that intelligence is what uh, we find what is most desirable? What if empathy is is, is more important to a society and, and to a well-functioning society uh, then would uh, then he'd probably have to be uh, (laughs) by his own logic sterilized yeah Yeah, but this is also so people like Sabisky I think at this point of time it's very easy to identify that there's something wrong there's an outlier in the bigger narrative currently existing and so we can we should get rid of him and he resigned right Hmm. a problem is that uh, if you look at the German experience right it started off not so dramatic we now know of the Holocaust and everything. But when it started off, it said that, oh, uh, there are people who are um, disabled, there are people who are infirm. Uh, and uh, for the broader uh, benefit of, of the nation, we do not have enough resources to, to take care of them. So we will first put them in hospital. Hmm. Right? Uh, so first they put the infirm in hospital and kind of quarantine them. Uh, then they said, you, you, if, you are, if, if you're disabled, you shouldn't be reproducing as well. So that was the first step. The second step was to say that, okay, but you know what? You're not never going to reproduce. You're still draining national uh, nation's resources. So, goodbye. Hmm. Right? So, that's when we started seeing the first murders happening. Yeah. And it was still supposed to be in this national cause. Uh, and people were okay with it because you're contributing to the nation. So you, because uh, And you're saying that, okay, you're disabled, so you have to go. That slowly started uh, transfiguring into this idea that Oh, Jews are bad. Jews have been draining the nation. Hmm. So let's start taking the Jews away and then let's start killing the Jews. And that morphed pretty subtly Hmm. over time. And because it was gradual, people were kind of getting, okay, this is the new normal. Okay, this is the new normal. This is the new normal. Till this whole thing happened, I think it just went out of hand. Right? That is the danger with gene editing. Because even we are saying that, okay, gene editing for health is good. We should be doing this. But that's the start. How do we make sure that we are not on a slippery slope where some day some guy comes in and says that, oh, you know what? You have been doing gene editing for health. It works. This is brilliant. Now let's start doing it for intelligence. The only answer is to have a conversation like this, I think. No technology can ever be separate from a social context. Um, and no no social context can be separate from the fact that there will always be certain groups that are more powerful, that have platforms, that have control of the media, that are able to push particular ideas, um, which is why you need to have a pushback from other sections of society, which is why you need to bring all this stuff out into the open, which is why you need accountability and transparency in decisions that are going to affect the rest of society at large. Um, so... The RCGM, for example, absolutely must be expanded. You need to have Mm -hmm. a more diverse group of people, not just in terms of professional backgrounds, but also, I think, in terms of socioeconomic backgrounds, who are able to grapple with the fact that an application of technology is not a black and white thing. Uh, you are not either a Luddite or somebody who's willing to use a technology to to bring humanity into a new utopia. Um, but 
you need to be able to interrogate the fact that these unconscious or conscious biases might always be at play in the way that these technologies will be used the marginalized must have a voice in all this like if if for example uh, the germans had disabled people who are on these committees mm-hmm. i don't think that they would have been anywhere yeah. uh, near as as dismissive about the potential that these people might have in terms of contributing to the nation um and of course like i have my own philosophical objections to just the way that nations are being defined now as is very unitary uh, one language one people one leader sort of narrative which are all things that don't gel with the underlying uh, democratic values and constitutional values of a lot of countries but that people are still going along with because as i said control of the media can matter a lot and these are all things that i think we should be aware of as citizens yeah. um these are all things that we should be able to call out when we see our leaders uh, discussing and these are things that we should be able to we should be able to call out in our near and dear ones and most importantly i think um even though shambhu and i are the resident geeks at thakshashila <laughs> um there should be more of us uh, technology yeah. should not be seen as this magical black box sort of thing into which you dump problems and solutions come out yeah. but as something that should be discussed and understood and then seen as not a magic wand uh, but as a tool that like every other tool that humans come up with can be used for good or can be used for evil yeah and i think particularly for generating a lot of people are circumspect because they're like ha huh, this is we don't understand this this is probably not going to affect us but just think of about this as another tool to improve human life and if i came to you today and said that i can give you a tool to magically make you better what kind of objections would you have hmm. what would you use the tool for what would others use the tool for and start having that conversation to begin with hmm. because really now is the time that we need to have this conversation to have more education to have more engagement uh, to make sure that any social issues that could uh, compromise the technology are stamped out yep and if not stamped out at least brought into the public discourse Yeah, awesome. That was very insightful, Anirudh. Thank, Thank you, you Doc. Old person. Thank you for being here. To keep listening to more episodes of All Things Policies. Thank you for listening. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at @takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, HDFC Life and Paytm Money. And let me tell you a couple of things that you should check out this week. On Litnama, Lakshmi talks to Hardeep Vaghela and Mohammad Munim from the band The Words of Alif. They talk about how the band came to be and more. On Football Football, the guys talk about Liverpool qualifying for the Champions League, City getting banned from it, and Arsenal thrashing Newcastle for a four nothing win. On Golgappa, tune into a Laugh Friday episode where host Tripti talks to Karan and Neil from Bhari Pa. On our Kannada podcast, Thale Harate, Ramya Bhaskar, and Shridhar Pabisati talk to Ganesh and Pawan about reimagining school education for Industry 4.0. On Top Three Tales, Madhuri tells a tale of her struggle with keeping cockroaches away from the kitchen while wondering why there are no cockroaches in her mother's kitchen. On Beyond Cliche, Almas is joined by the Mahi Way actor Pushti Shakti to talk about beauty beyond size. Thanks and keep listening. Welcome to Peak Planet, a new podcast where we delve into the fallouts of the growth path that we and indeed much of the world has chosen. Sustainable growth is the buzzword. Until we nail that down, we need to ensure that we keep our population healthy. and also have the resources for our increasingly urban lifestyles. I'm Karthik Ganesan, a researcher at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, a Delhi-based policy research institute. Where for almost a decade we've been trying to explain and change the use, reuse and misuse of our resources. In the first season of Peak Planet, we take up air pollution, public enemy number 1 and an invisible one at that. Increasingly the most important risk factor for adverse health outcomes, air pollution has become the most unwanted byproduct for aggressively growing economy. Over four episodes, we find out how prepared our systems are to deal with this crisis. You can catch the entire first season of Peak Planet out now on the IVM Podcasts app or website or wherever you get your podcasts from.